All right. <clears throat> Looks like we're good to go. Um, here we are for lesson two. That first one was pretty long, some 120, 22 pages or something like that. Again, <clears throat> just to reiterate, this is not my program. These are not my lessons. So I'm not teaching these. I'm not teaching these per se as lessons. What I'm doing is kind of giving you an overview, a look at this, these lessons from several, several different angles. Um, uh, the lessons themselves in the objective sense. In a subjective sense, putting a little bit of a historical content uh, or bent to them. Uh, for instance, in the first lesson, there was some material material in there geared towards classic science and ether. And if you're wondering what all that is, just go back to lesson one, um, which is archaic. Right around the time uh, Hill wrote this, 1928, I think it was just a few years before when Salve, the Salve Conference occurred in Europe. And Einstein and Planck and Boyle and all those people were talking about uh, quantum physics. Um, so the understanding of um, matter and how it functions or operates or exists uh, was fundamentally changed. And we moved into contemporary science. So some of this is a little outdated. We talk about that too. That's the second. Third part is kind of uh, the definitional context of the lessons themselves and how that approach uh, to to the recipient of the lessons okay and I'll show you what that means in a second so this is a uh, lesson two definite chief aim uh basic, basically a goal you know setting goals and everybody needs to to set goals right and we talked about shoot and aim right? Meaning you want to do some planning, some good brainstorming, some rigorous walk through, thinking it through, doing some background work and uh, research and examination of self. And as applies to, as it applies to, you know, after understanding self uh, and then apply that to a particular path that you want to follow and then determine um, what type of learning, training, education you'll need to pursue that path. Um, and then moving forward from there. So, and that's what all of this stuff is about, you know, and in the first chapter, it was mentioned, there was a list there of maybe a, a dozen or more, 12, 15 or more uh, types of people, or uh, I would guess, I would guess types of people in the workforce uh, or, or workforce um, sectors uh, who could benefit from the benefit from this. And again, it, it was a wide array, basically saying everybody. Okay, so that's a key point. Um, again, I'm going to stop at these quotes. This is Henry Van Dyke. Um, most of these quotes are very insightful, very enlightening, very mind brain expanding. You're going to take those synaptic nerves and really run up and down them and expand those brain cells with some good insight and information and some eurekas and ahas and wows, right? The best rose bush after all is not that which has the fewest thorns, but that which bears the finest roses. There you go. And I think I've read this one before. Um, so it's, it's talking about <clears throat> the thorns. Um, life is not easy. Life is usually at least as regards to uh, growth, right? If you want to uh, grow uh, in the in the workforce, in the workplace, uh, intellectually, emotionally, spiritually, psychologically, oftentimes you have to brush up against the thorns of life, the challenges of life. That's oftentimes why to grow, to strengthen yourself, to strengthen your character, to strengthen your, your endurance, your compassion, your ability to comprehend, understand, deal with problems, work through problems, uh, survive the battles, of life, and I can tell you, you're going to have them. I've had many, many. I should list them all someday, you know. And most people had many, some more uh, than others, but nobody 
as Jim Morrison said of the doors, nobody gets out of here alive, right? Or unscathed or unpricked by thorns, right? So that's a good, good quote. Um, all right, so, so this is a bit of a, the course description, right? And it's interesting, I wanna go through this because it really orients you to not only what the intent of the course was, is, but also what it was at the time, right? Again, this was 1928. So for today's reader, viewer, uh, maybe a good portion of this seems familiar, but back in the day, there wasn't much of, or much of any of this around. You know, this is really the first time that um, achievement principles, I guess you could say, success or achievement principles, were really um, put down on paper, really looked at thoroughly, vigorously, right? Um, people actually, the successful actually interview, that's the best way to go to the source, I say. People often complain or um, not complain, but argue, I guess, about goats. Who's the greatest of all time in basketball? I don't I don't sit there and try to figure it out using statistics or facts or comparison, comparative data, blah, blah, blah. I just go to the goats themselves, right? Themselves. Uh, look at the great players. Like Kobe Bryant was asked one time. He said, listen, listen, it's a short list. Listen, do that. Linda, listen. <laughs> he said, Wilt, me, Michael, or MJ, right? Wilt, me, Michael. That's what he said. So a lot of people um, don't put Wilt in the mix. And if you understand what he was about, all about, uh, you can't ignore him. But for some reason, he gets ignored. I don't know why. Um, but I've listened to many of the greats, Michael Jordan, uh, Larry Bird, uh, Dr. J, Shaq, Kobe, and many others, you know, who, who professional basketball players back in the day and even contemporary players talk about the greats. And they often mention Will Champlin. A lot of fans don't. You know, they say, oh, those people played back when they're part-time teachers and plumbers or something weird like that. But anyways, you know what I'm saying? Anyways, here we go. You are at the beginning of a course of philosophy, which was the first time, first time in the history of the world. Is that true? Is that hyperbolic? Is that kind of an overstatement? Kind of, you know, keep in mind that he's trying to sell this. So salespeople will have a tendency to think, think of Donald Trump, you know, very bigly, best ever, greatest, you know. So people in the field of sales or those who are looking to sell something often, I don't want to say often, will uh, at times or even frequently overstate that the first time in the history of the world has been organized from the known factors which have been used and must always be used by successful people. Must always be used. Uh, first time in the history of the world, right? Uh, that's questionable, debatable. But, you know, certainly uh, one of the first times that uh, success data or success principles, I should say, um, and data uh, were organized, formalized into a text formalized via interviewing the goats themselves, right? Not just sitting back and reading a bunch of books on you know, biographies or whatnot, but going to the source, ask the goats themselves, right? Don't try to guess, don't try to imagine, don't go to the data, don't go to the secondhand data, go to the primary source, not secondary, go to the primary source. Literary style, so this is uh, his approach, has been completely subordinated for the sake of skating, stating the principles and laws included in this course in such a manner that they may be quickly and easily assimilated by people in every walk of life. There you go. So not just for those who are looking to become rich and famous, right? Some of the principles described in the course are familiar to all who will read the course. There you go. Even back then, but now probably even more so, right? Others are here stated for the first time. And many of those first time then are probably familiar, more familiar to people now. Should be kept in mind from the first lesson to the last that the value of the philosophy lies entirely in the thought stimuli it will produce in the mind of the student, not merely in the lessons themselves, right? So that's what it is. So the lessons are just a tool. What's really important is getting, getting those ideas into your mind and that you work upon them. 
first in the intellectual process. And that's how everything starts. I talked about this before. Everything that has ever existed first began in the mind, right? This new country, this desk, this table, this you, me, right? When your parents met in the mind, they're going, I think I love that person. Let's have a family, right? So most everything in, in existence, some even people who believe in, uh, who are religious say that, you know, same, same thing with God. Uh, before creating the earth and the planets and the flora and the fauna, uh, it was established as thoughts in the mind, the great intellect, the great I am. Right? Stated in another way, this course is intended as a mind stimulant that will cause the student to organize and direct to a definite end, definite chief aim, the forces of his or her mind, thus harnessing the stupendous power which most people waste in spasmodic, purposeless thought. Bingo. This is what the majority of people do, still do, do their entire lives. This is why Napoleon Hill, Earl Nightingale, uh, Tony Robbins, anybody who's in the success field will tell you, most people just kind of float. Uh, I think it was Earl Nightingale who talked about the secret, the great secret. It was a different secret. He, there was a book based on the secret based on, um, there's a book called The Secret based on concepts in this book, uh, but Earl Nightingale talked about The Secret. I think he called it The Great Secret, which is that most people just follow the followed who've been following the followers forever, right? Bunch of lemmings or dodo birds. Ever see Ice Age? Dodo, 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 off the cliff. They're following people off the cliff, right? Don't be, the, don't be a dodo bird. Singleness of purpose is essential for success. True. No matter may, what may be one's idea of the definition of success, yes, singleness of purpose is a quality which may and generally does call for thought on many allied subjects, right? So now he goes into an example. Again, I talked about writing. This is the way that you establish yourself. You establish your idea uh, in the general or the vague or the abstract, right? Just the, just the concept, the idea itself. And then to, to really get the point across, you give some practical examples or some data, char data charts, facts, expert testimony, blah, 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 so forth. I'll skip that paragraph about Jack Dempsey. He was a great boxer. The student of this course is or should be engaged in the business of training for success and the battle of life. There you go, not a war. You're not a nation. Uh, your, yours is going to be uh, maybe small skirmishes at times, but battles nevertheless within the greater war, which is maybe the everybody in the United States trying to fend for themselves, right, uh, in, in the workforce. To win, there are many factors which must have attention. A well-organized, alert, and energetic mind. Well-organized. This is what employers are looking for now. Alert, active, engaged, enthusiastic. How do you get all that? Well, read this stuff and do what you love to do. Tap into your inner innate, born with them, came to this earth with them, tendencies, inclinations, desires, knowings, feelings, sensations, right? It's in you, right? What do you want to do? You know what you want to do to a degree, right? And if you don't know, keep working on it until it becomes made clear and evident. To win, there are many factors which must have attention. A well-organized, alert, and energetic mind is produced by various and sundry, meaning a variety of stimuli, all of which are plainly described in these lessons. It should be remembered, however, that the mind requires for its development a variety of exercises. Just as the physical body to be properly developed calls for many forms of sis systematic exercise. And it's true, variety of exercise. I think I knew this innately many, many decades ago when I just started out after graduating from college. That's when I sat down and I started to read. I said, you know, if I'm gonna be teaching, if I'm, I'm gonna be coaching uh, people, uh, young people mostly, um, maybe late teens, into their 20s, early 30s or so, roughly. That's kind of the general age range. Um, if I'm going, going to be helping these people, I probably want to know about people, humans. So that's when I started to read about the various disciplines. I looked into philosophy. I looked into psychology. I looked into theology. I looked into, I looked into markets. I looked into political science. I looked into the money system. I looked into the constitution, law of the land. I looked in, into economics and science and math and blah, 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 right? If I'm going to teach humans and help humans move forward into the workforce, then I'm gonna have to know something 
considerably about humans and then the workforce and so forth and so on, right? So this, this all comes from understanding your chief aim. Um, then there's an example, horses are trained, right? So he's, get, he's giving you some, some example. Um, you will observe before you have gone very far into this philosophy that the reading of these lessons will super, super induce, there you go, I thought it was supersede, but super induce a flow of thoughts covering a wide range of subjects. Hmm. Sound familiar? For this reason, the student should read the course with a notebook and pencil at hand. That's what I did all the time. I was constantly, all these books that I read, I don't know if I've had, I have any, let's see if there's anything here per se that I, I, I would annotate. No, that's not one. Let me see if I can kind of, oh, this might be one. Yeah, in the beginning, I kind of got away from the annotating as I got as the technology advanced. Yeah, I don't see anything here. Hold on, hold on. Talk among yourselves. Yeah, something like this. This is a book on punctuation. All right. I see some annotating in here. I think we need need more light. Uh, a little bit a little bit of annotating in here. Let me get into this here. Not a lot, I guess. But here's 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 some. I don't know if you can see that. Right. I'm underlining uh true key point um circling uh keywords and phrases that I may question. If I find that certain points are not relevant to what I'm teaching. I like five and sorry. Yeah, five and six, you can see there at the top five and six, I cross them out. Um, so that's that's what he's talking about, right? Not a lot of annotating in there. But anyways, and I, I, I used to do that. I don't read nearly as much as I used to because after a point you've, you've primed the pump. You've saturated the pump. I still read. Most of the knowledge I garner now is from videos because people who used to put their stuff into books are not, have now gone online. So I get a lot of it uh, in, in, that, in that way. And I, I listen to, um, and even documentaries, you know, Netflix and whatnot. I listen to uh, historical documentaries and pieces and videos. Uh, um, I, I, I listen to political. I listen to economic. I'm a, an investor myself. So I listened to a lot of, I had these unsubscribed, all these different types of videos. Um, crypto, cryptocurrency, I'm a cryptocurrency investor, um, finance, um, uh, politics, uh, theology and philosophy and so forth, right? So I, I still, pretty much on a daily basis, rarely taking a break. I get bored actually, if I'm sitting around too long for, um, even you know, a few hours, half a day just drives me nuts doing nothing, right? All right, anyways, where were we? Um, by following this suggestion, the student will have a collection of ideas by the time the course has been read two or three times, sufficient to transform his or her entire life plan. Collection of ideas. So that's what I think you need to get from it. If you want somebody to teach you this, these lessons, uh, don't come to me. This, this, is, this isn't my book. Maybe there's people out there that can teach you these lessons. I don't know if it's necessary, but if you're interested, you can do some research. I don't know. I haven't looked into that. I have my own book and lessons, which I will go over at some point. Right now, I'm trying to present a very broad uh, foundation, right? Uh, the first thing that I really, I, I, first video, I think, was an overview of what I am, what I'm about, what this company is about, Interprojection my philosophy, my programs, where it started, where I am, where I'm going, that type of stuff. And then I did three videos on career career and life, uh, how to get that situated, because, you know, be aware of what's out there educationally and so forth. But 
Um, oh, by following this practice, it will be noticed very soon that the mind has become like a magnet and that it will attract useful ideas right out of the thin air. To use the words of a noted scientist who has experimented with this principle for a great number of years. You will do yourself a great injustice if you undertake this course with even a remote feeling that do you do not need that you do not stand in need of more knowledge than you now possess. Interesting. I saw this something um, written on this one time. Forgot the source, but uh, probably one of my critical thinking books. Uh, it stated that uh, a lot of people think that there's they know more than they do. Uh, we are very good at self deception. Uh, we can deceive ourselves in many ways. Why? Why? Because uh, we we don't like to look at ourselves in a bad a bad light. We'd rather uh, be lazy in our thinking and deceive ourselves than understand the truth and do the hard work to uh, fill in the gaps with stuff that we don't know. I'll just pretend I know it. And if people start asking me questions or coming at me, I'll just get angry. Shoo them away. In truth, no man knows enough about any worthwhile subject to entitle him to feel that he has the last word on the subject. True. Talked about we are all equal in our infinite ignorance. Even if you're an expert Einstein in a particular field, uh, he was an expert in physics, right? Science is a very broad field. And even he himself said that I don't know everything. Uh, before he died, he said, you know, these theories, no theory is absolute. That's what uh, Stephen Hawking said. No theory is absolute. So Einstein himself knew that someday, good, very good chance that somebody will come along and improve upon these theories or connect um, quantum theory with relativity to uh, come to a greater understanding of existence, matter, where it came from, where we are and where we're going. And we will know the mind of God, as Stephen Hawking said, if that happens, right? I guess good luck with that. Anyways, and the long, hard task of trying to wipe out some of my own ignorance and make way for some of the useful truths of life. I have often seen in my imagination the great maker who stands at the gateway entrance of life and writes, poor fool, on the brow of those who believe they are wise. There you go. The wisest people, the smartest people are the people that know they're not wise, that wise and that smart. They know they come from extreme limitations, right? Extreme inability to know all that exists. Um, Stephen Hawking said, the great thing about science is that there's always questions. There will always be uh, new knowledge to discover because we know an infinitesimally small percentage amount of all existing knowledge, right? And science, modern science is relatively new, right? Since the turn of the uh, 20th century, so 120 years or so, 125 years. Uh, great maker of the poor sinner on the brown, which translated into workaday language means that none of us know very much and by the very nature of our being can never know as much as we need to know in order to live sanely. That's why Einstein, Einstein said intuition is everything, right? Everything. Because he said, you can only, you can only, you only have so much time to study and to learn and to reflect, all right? At some point, you just got to put the books down, he says, and go with your gut instinct. And this has been said by people in business, in science, and other fields, right? Humility is a forerunner of success. Uh, there's a story of a great CEO, forget the guy's name, but he was at meetings and he was often very quiet taking notes, right? And they go, uh, sir, sir, why aren't you speaking up and you know, giving your 10 cents or your millions of dollars of knowledge and insight? You're the CEO, goes, shh, shh, I'm learning, right? Um, George Washington was a great general, why? Because he knew that he didn't know. You know when, he was, when he was first assigned to be the general of the army, right? the five-star commanding general, right? He he knew that he didn't have experience. So he would go to the officers, the commanding officers in the field, the junior officers in the field, and listen. Ask questions, pay attention, listen, take notes, right? Imagine that. Great generals and CEOs taking notes, right? Until we become humble in our hearts, we are not apt to profit greatly by the experiences and thoughts of others. Bingo. There it is. That's the CEO, that's um, Einstein, that's Washington, right? Sounds like a preachment on morality. Well, what if it does, right? And I'm going to skip, I'm going to skip around here because uh, I don't want to take all the time. This is shorter, about half the length of chapter one, but still lengthy. So I don't want to spend way too much time. Success in life is largely predicated upon our, our knowing men. 
or men who are knowing. The best place to study the man animal is in your own mind. There you go. That's what I did. That's why I was reading books every summer for 10 or 12 years, five, six, seven books in various disciplines to know the man animal, right? When you know yourself thoroughly, you will also know much about others. That's true. To know others, not as they seem to be, but as they really are, study them through the posture of the body, the tone of the voice, eyes, use of words, right? This is kind of uh, getting, all, becoming to uh, encroach upon the lines of what uh, Ching Ning Chu uh, speaks to in her book, Thick Face, Black Heart. And again, uh, you know, I'll go over that sometime. Uh, it, really get to know men. Study them when they're angry, when in love, when money is involved, eating, no kidding, eating. Gluttony, right? Riding in trouble, right? When they're when they're down and up, right? Look at look at them at their best and at their worst, or yourself, right? Like uh, is stated many times, it's easy to love when you're when you love people, and it's easy to be in a good mood when things are going well. But how do you function when you're dealing with people you don't love, or difficult people, or you're dealing with challenges, trials, right? Um. This course, I'm going to skip down a little bit. This course has been des so designed that the student who masters it may take inventory of himself and of others by other than snap judgment methods. And this is what people do. They, you know, online or offline, they'll just look and boom, they go with the first thought that comes to their brain. And oftentimes it's wrong. And I will frequently uh, mention that to people online. I do that offline in my classes, but it's, it's probably, it's very common. So don't do that common mistake. The student who masters this philosophy will be able to look through the outer crust of personal adornment surface, right? Close, so-called culture and like, and down deep into the heart, right? Again, deep into the heart. This is inner projection. It's not outer projection or surface projection, inner, the deep stuff, right? It would not have been made if the author of this philosophy had not known from years of experimentation and analysis that the promise can be met. Some who have examined the manuscripts Let's skip over that. Of uh, this course is asked why it's not called the course in master salesmanship. The answer is that the word salesmanship is commonly associated with the marketing goods services, and it would therefore narrow down uh, and circumscribe the real nature of the course. If it is true that this is a course in master salesmanship, providing one takes a deeper than average view of the meaning of salesmanship. This philosophy is intended to enable those who master it to sell their way through life successfully with the minimum amount of resistance and friction. Such a, a course, therefore, must help the student organize and make use of much truth, which is overlooked by the majority. Boom. That's a critical thinker when you see words like that. Most of the time, all the time, never, majority, very important. Keywords and phrases, boom. That's why majority, that's important. Not half the people, not some of the people, majority. Overlooked by the majority of people who go through life as mediocres. Majority, there you go, right? I talked about um, Earl Nightingale, um, uh, Napoleon Hill, uh, Tony Robbins. They, they, they almost to the person, anybody in the field of achievement says not enough people do this. Therefore, they just kind of like automatons. They're just following lemmings, dodo words, just following the file. You know, I'm going to go up to that job because. That's where my parents work. That's where the money is. That's where the green or STEM jobs are. Um, that's where my friends work. You know, that's where my president says I should work. Or, you know, it's all it's all external. You got to go inside. We prefer illusions to realities. Didn't I just say that? Brilliant minds think alike. <laughs> New truths, if accepted uh, at all, are taken with the proverbial grain of salt. Some of us demand more than a mere pinch of salt. We demand enough to pickle new ideas so they become useless. <laughs> That's great, right? People will, if it's a new idea or a new way of looking at things, if, if it's not established and you see this in business, religion, uh, sports, the sports world, right? Uh, anywhere and ever, you know, unless it's immediate to my experience and I'm used to it and, and it's something that I've experienced it, if it's old, if it's archaic, if it's more than 10 years old, that's not important, it's irrelevant. Those are old times. And that's when people were different, inferior, physically, mentally, whatever, you know, blah, blah, blah. Um, nothing could be less true, right? For these reasons, the introductory lesson of this course and this lesson as well cover subjects intended to pave the way for new ideas. So those ideas will not be too severe a shock to the mind of the student, right? New ideas. Think of matrix, right? 
the first uh, movie, right? Um, Neo uh, is taken out of the matrix. The matrix is, and that's what I call many of the systems in which we live and work in, right? There's the uh, education matrix, there's the political matrix, there's the health matrix, there's all these matrices that we live in. We think they're, they're this, we think, we think they're XYZ, but they're actually ABC, right? So Neo and all those living in the matrix who are plugged into the program, virtual reality, these databases or AI, uh, uh, artificial intelligence learning um, programs, right? Um, or learned programs probably by that time in technology, right? Expert systems um, or ex databases based in expert systems, uh, AI, uh, algorithms, all that stuff. Um, that's what the, um, the matrix is, is based in, right? So Neo um, is pulled out of the matrix because he's the one, he's N-E-O-O-N-E, -E -E, the one. He's the Messiah, he's the savior. The two brothers that wrote the movie uh, read a lot of Eastern and Western theology, philosophy. So, you know, uh, Trinity, the Holy Trinity, Nebuchadnezzar, you know, that's the ship. That's one of the, that was one of the great uh, kings back in the Old Testament. Yeah, wasn't a very good king. But anyways, all that, I'm getting off course. Um, the, so the Matrix is about Neo. And the reason why there, there was danger of pulling him out of the Matrix, right? Um, is the fact that he had been in it. He had been living a lie too long. Um, Morpheus says to him, we were a little leery about pulling you out because usually people who are in the matrix too long, this is great metaphors for life, right? Uh, story fiction, the greatest fiction literature. There's often a good analogy or good analogies for, for real life, reality, the real world. And it's true. If you live in a matrix, if you believe a lie, if you believe something too long, uh, when the truth comes to you, you'd be like, yeah. And he said the people that came too late to the truth would actually hyperventilate, get ill, sick, and die, right? So that's one of the reasons why he got <clears throat> very ill when they first pulled him out of the matrix. Anyways, so not all people are so constituted that they wish to know the truth, right? Um who was the the uh, the evil guy with the bald head there? He said at one point, um, he, he gave the information, the codes to get into uh, um, Zion, right? Um, and he's giving the codes to uh, Mr. Smith, right? The, the, the head evil uh, agent program. He's giving the codes to uh, Mr. Smith. And he says, you know, when I go back in, I want to forget everything. I want to forget all of this reality stuff. I want to be rich. I want to be able to taste food again, good food, good quality. I want to be, have money. I want to be an actor. It's funny, ironic, because you know, he is an actor in real life, right? Um, so in real life, uh, fiction uh, uh, portrays real life, right? Not all people are constituted that they wish to know the truth, right? One of the greatest surprises the author of this course has met with in connection with his research activities is that so few, few, key word phrase, few, a lot, many, important, critical, few people are willing to hear the truth when it shows up their own weaknesses. We prefer allusions to realities. Mm. New truths, if accepted at all, are taken with a proverbial grain of salt. Some of the us demand more than a mere pinch of salt. We demand enough to pickle new ideas for them to get confused. I love that one. Anyways. So rainy night. So now we've got some examples. So we held and we go forth and so on. Uh, if you look at the middle uh, part there. So this, this is what you do with your writing. You present certain ideas, uh, concrete ideas. And they're, they're ideas. So they're a little, uh, maybe a little difficult to understand if they're just ideas in the abstract, right? to make them concrete or real or more obvious or evident to the human being. That's why you have to provide stories, evidence, uh, analogies, uh, similes, metaphors, um, examples uh, by experts and lay people, data and charts and graphs, right? We hate to be disturbed in the beliefs and prejudices that have been handed down with the family for What he said, right? 
we we're all born into society. We are born in a certain place, in a certain time, in a certain community, in a certain way, with certain political leanings, with certain religious leanings, with certain familial family leanings, and so forth and so on, right? And we grow up in that within that little small, tiny, minuscule world. And we think that that tiny little world is the world, but it's not, right? It's like, you know, sports fans, oh, greatest team ever. We're the greatest fans ever. Our players are the greatest players ever, right? Um, then the last paragraph, there is no adequate reason why the average man, little bias there, people, woman, people, average person, she ever closes her mind to fresh slants on life. He does just the same. Nothing is more tragic or more common than mental inertia. This stuff is great. This is cool, right? We are inert by nature. It's very difficult to get us off our asses, our collective butts, right? We would much rather sleep late, not go to the gym, not get up, go to work, be to work on time. Put in the extra effort, go in every day, go in day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year. Our 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 natural, our natural tendency is to do the easy thing. So that's what you're gonna work against, that friction, brushing up against it all the time in life. And the only way that you achieve or get anything done is by not be not going with your natural tendencies, fighting against your natural inertia, you know. So true, so true, right? Uh, where was I? Adequate reason why the average man should ever close his mind in fresh slants. He does just the same. Nothing is more tragic than mental inertia. For every 10 men who are physically lazy, there are 10,000 with stagnant minds. Oh, that's great. That's great. Yeah, so the mind is usually that which is most uh, deficient, right? And stagnant minds are the breeding places of fear. Oh, my gosh. This is gold. Right? I'm not sure about the lessons, uh, but the explanations, the descriptions, the content of what he's explaining, dead on. And I, I actually haven't read this in years. Um, I, I told you, I, I read it many times, several times, and even wrote, sat down and wrote dozens of articles based on these chapters and ideas and concepts. So most of them have become a part of me. That's why I'm so familiar with them. I haven't read it in a long time, but you can see I'm relating to it and explaining in great detail about what he's talking about, right? Old farmer. So now another example, right? Every person should make it his business to gather new ideas from sources other than the environment in which he daily lives and works. So this is this is what I knew innately when I was reaching out to other disciplines and sources and learnings and experiences, right? Me, myself, I've lived in, uh, you know, I've been outside of the United States, but even in the United States, I've lived in five, six different uh, states. I've lived in probably 22 different places, maybe 11, 12 different towns and cities, you know, from Connecticut to Boston to Chicago to Texas, New Mexico, LA, you know, seeing and going and moving all across the physical landscape and that's that's a growth opportunity too that stretches you, but also the mental landscape. You got to work on both the mental, the physical, emotional as well. Stretch the emotional. If you're not happy or comfortable with something, too bad. Go do it. Maybe it'll help you. And if you know it will help you, do it. Right. The mind becomes withered, stagnant, narrow, and closed unless it searches for new ideas. I think this is why people die early. This is what why their minds go. Right. They're not pushing it all the time. Like if you don't keep doing setups, you're gonna get flabby. Same with the brain, right? Uh, the farmer should come to the city quite often and walk among the strange faces and tall buildings. I've done that. I have lived in major cities. I have lived in Hartford. I have lived in Boston, Chicago, Los Angeles, right? And I've seen many of the major cities you know, around, around the country. I've got more to see, but I've probably seen at least half, half of maybe about half or slightly more than half of all the states in the United States. He will go back to his farm, his mind refreshed with more courage and greater enthusiasm, right? Everyone needs a change of mental environment at regular periods. This is why you need also vacations, time off. 
because you get stuck in a loop. You, you know, you go to work, wake up, go to work, go to come home, da, 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 right? And you really don't have time, pause, and think or reflect. And when you take time off, a week or two at a time, preferably two weeks, all of a sudden you pause and you stop. And your brain and your being gets to breathe and contemplate and reflect. Open, it begins, it begins to open. And you start to see things clearly. Oh my gosh, I'm stuck in a terrible job and a terrible relationship and a terrible town at a terrible company with terrible people. What am I doing with my life, right? So you need to take breaks, take time off, do things that will get you out of your comfort zone, different perspectives in regards to work, in regards to mental experience, and then also in regards to the physical as well. Keep, keep working those things, working and working and the emotional, uh, uh, spiritual as well. Right? Um, as a student of this course, you will temporarily lay aside the set of ideas with which you perform your daily labors and enter a field of entirely new ideas. Splendid. You will come out at the other end of the course with a new stock of ideas, which will make you more efficient, more enthusiastic. Don't we need that? You know, you, you see people getting beat down by life, you know, they're really not doing what they should be doing, what they know they should be doing. They're just doing following the follower who's been following the followed forever, right? And at first you're okay, but then a year or two goes by, five years, six years, 10 years, you're just, 10 years in, you're beat down. You're not efficient. You're not enthusiastic. You have no energy. You have no spark. Sad day for you. Do not be afraid of new ideas. Some of the ideas introduced in this course will require no further explanation or proof of their soundness because they are familiar to practically everyone. Every principle described in this course has been thoroughly tested by the author, and the majority of the principles covered have been tested by scores of scientists. This is what I'm talking about. So in science, um, science scientists uh, base what they're doing in empirical data, right? Empirical data is you can touch it, taste it, smell it, see it. It's tangible, right? Plus, if you have a uh, theory, right, uh, you run experiment, 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 you do it, and then have a whole bunch of other scientists do it. And after a time, if it's done rigorously enough, thoroughly enough, right, and it's been proven time and time and time and time again by different scientists using their own experiments, whatever, to look at what you're talking about from different angles, from different perspectives, from different times, from different mental capacities, from different individual subjective personalities and objective personalities when you're looking at science. Science is oftentimes measured through the objective, right? Measuring instruments that are not subjective, right? But still the individual looking at the data, it's, it's subjective, right? So it proves, so he's shown you that a lot of this has been looked at rigorously, not just an idea that I thought of a few times and wrote a book, right? Um, he interviewed a bunch of people first, then he wrote this stuff down, then he tried it out and tested it, right? Um, there is a principle which is a bar against, I'm looking at the italicized information here. There is a principle which is a bar against all information, which is proof against all argument, and which cannot fail to keep a man in everlasting ignorance. This principle is contempt prior to examination, right? If it's coming from a particular angle or perspective of a person or a party or an age or a group or a class or whatever, you know, bias, prejudice, then I, I don't want to look at it because you know, I know those people or that group or class or whatever. Right. So that's that's biased thinking. That's not open minded. And you have to be unbiased and open minded in order to be successful. Virtue. By and large, there is no such thing as something for nothing. In the long run, you'll get exactly that for which you pay, whether you're buying an automobile or a loaf of bread. So you can steal stuff. You can slouch about. You can steal and uh, deceive and lie about and maybe get by by doing things in a underhanded, lazy way. Sure, you might have some excess temporary, but it, it's not. It's not. It's a. It's weakness. You always have to work with the strong. What, what is strong? What is the strength, right? Go with strength. Don't go with weakness. Being lazy or not even-handed, right? Underhanded. That's all That's all weakness. Um, let's see. 
Dr. Alexander Graham Bell gives an example, Steinmetz. You got John Burroughs and Luther Burbank. So he's Dr. Elmer Gates. Uh, so he's giving examples here, and I'm not going to go into all of these examples. Let me lay before you a brief outline of what this lesson is and what it is intended to do for you. Having prepared myself for the practice of law, I will offer this introduction as a statement of my case. So a lawyer. Lawyers are taught to think uh, uh, objectively, logically, based in evidence, not fantasy, empirical data, if you will, right? as best you can in a court of law. A court of law is not a laboratory. There's a lot of human intangibles there, right? Such as the jury, right? Um, the evidence with which to back up my case will be presented in the 16 lessons of which the course is composed. Yeah, so uh, lawyers don't come up with absolute solutions based on absolute results. There has to be a preponderance of evidence, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe in the laboratory, there's absolute evidence or greater than a preponderance means 60, 70% at least, right? Right. Um, so and a court of law is often based in uh, observation of individuals who are not experts, right? Yeah, uh, and also understanding of things to people who are not experts, the jury, right? Uh, they're, they're just common folk, lay people, right? They're not disciplined in uh, logic or thinking, uh, comprehensive, critical thinking, thorough, rigorous thinking, right? Uh, the facts out of which this course has been prepared have been gathered through more than 25 years of business and professional experience. So now he's showing you, right? He's providing, providing evidence or facts or support why, why this, these lessons, why this book, why him, why this, right? He's telling you, right? Um, before this reading course on the Law of Success was published, the manuscripts were submitted to two prominent universities with requests that they be read. See, so he's giving you one of the professors to examine. So he's giving you uh, considerable extensive data uh, evidence as to the validity um, of, of this course, right? I'm going to the italicized part here, uh, uh, paragraph. Success is the development of the power with which to get whatever one wants in life without interfering with the rights of others. Uh, sounds like the law of the land. The law of the land protects people so that they can move about the country and do whatever it is they want to do, right? And they can do whatever they want to do as long as it doesn't affect the rights of others. So that's kind of a, I don't want to, not a, not a democracy, but a kind of a constitutional republic, a republic type of um, concept or political environment background, right? Um, I would lay particular stress upon the word power because it, it is inseparable, inseparably related to success. We're living in a world during an age of intense competition. I think that's probably got even more intense, 1928, about 2023. And the law of survival of fitness is everywhere in evidence because of these facts and so forth and so on, right? What is power? Power is organized energy or effort. This course brings to you, I'm just kind of skipping around, brings to you a definite promise, namely that through its mastery and application, you can get whatever you want with but two qualifying words, within reason. So as a lawyer, he gets a little hyperbolic at times, meaning overstating, but at the same time, he always seems to bring it back, right? He wants to sell this, but he doesn't want to, lie to you or deceive you. Being a lawyer, I guess a good lawyer, not an ambulance chase. He's, he's qualifying it. You always want to qualify, quantify, specify. Yeah, absolutely true. Without a doubt, always going to happen. Never. He's not saying that, right? Within reason. You can have, you know, 100 people who will read this stuff, grow through the course, allegedly, same amount of time, same amount of effort, same amount of hours put in, and not all 100 of them will be successful, right? Because individuals vary, individual efforts vary, individual circumstances vary, right? So there's never, never a hundred percent guarantee on almost anything. Well, you can be guaranteed if you're here, you can be guaranteed to be born and die, pay taxes. That's this. What else we got? Um, without a single exception, boom, right there. See, that's an absolute. Very rarely do you see statements like that by people who are uh, well-disciplined in their thinking, trained well in their thinking. Right? 
lawyers are, I have several lawyer friends just contacted one and they're, they're very good at uh, thinking. Not perfect, not without bias, but better than most in their thinking. Without a single exception, those who have attained unusual success have done so either consciously or unconsciously through the aid of all or a portion of the 15 major factors of which this course is compiled. Compile, sorry, boom, right there. Carnegie, Rockefeller, Hill, Ford. Right. Nearly 20 years ago, I interviewed, so now he's giving some specific examples, which I will not go through, right? Then and there, second paragraph, the seed out of which this course has been developed was sown in my mind. What did I say? All begins here, right? And then outward, inward, outward. But that seed did not take root or germinate until later. This interview marked the beginning of the years of research, right? Again, he's going into examples and details, right? If you can run a losing race without blaming your loss on someone else, you have bright prospects of success further down the road in the life, right? So people will often do that, even fans, you know, oh, we lost because of the reps. Uh, we lost because uh, the other players cheated. Uh, we lost because our main guy or guys were injured. Always excuses, right? Maybe you lost because you're just not as good as the other team. How about that? Or maybe you're just as good, but that day it didn't work. It wasn't, you weren't in the flow. That happens in sports. You see it all the time. Like LSU, who were they playing? World College World Series. There was one game where I think um, Florida, right? Florida won. Or was it LSU? I forget. Uh, game two, it was 24 to four, right? Florida won. Or one of the teams, we'll say Florida. Florida won that game. Then the next game, LSU won like 17 to five or something, right? Yeah. Is Florida that good? Is LSU that good? On, the, on those particular days, yeah. But overall, you know, LSU overall. And I think the first game was like four to three. It was a normal game. So that's that's kind of like a metaphor for life, you know. Um, life, in the short run, there you have really good days, really bad days. But in the long run, if you do this stuff, you're going to have much better days, much better life, more fulfilling, more exacting and exacting. Look those words up. Exacting and exacting. Uh, Carnegie, let's see. Um, Mr. Carnegie's ability to inspire men rested on something deeper than any faculty of judgment. Deeper, right? So, so this is this is about character Schwab, Mr. Schwab. I forget exactly what he was involved in, but a lot of money. Is it this? Any other business he did in the steel, oh, steel business? There you go. Although no, it's Carnegie. Um. So, um. That's what it is. It's it's the thing that really um, helps one maintain and achieve success is character. Something in here, something of strength. Look at look at people who are out there doing doing it at the highest levels. Um, entertainers, uh, athletes, politicians. There's something about them, something solid and of substance. Generally speaking, not always, right? Something solid and of substance. There's a certain strength there, right? Where does it come from? It comes from a concerted effort and doing doing the right things over and over again. Um, so here, any modern railroad bridge is an excellent example. So now he's giving examples, exemplification. There is a worthwhile lesson in this story of the man and his seven forces. Organized effort. So he, again, he's giving you kind of uh, general abstract or ideas in the abstract, concepts, principles, and then explaining them in the specific through stories and evidence and individuals and that stuff. There's a worthwhile lesson in the story of the man and the seven, oh, sorry, I skipped over that. Organized effort may be made a power, but it may also be made dangerous power unless guided with intelligence. And intelligence here probably also entails ethics, right? Uh, <clears throat> there are very intelligent people who are unethical. So, I mean, you can be unethical, immoral, you know, but it catches up with you. Almost everybody I've seen over the years who's been unethical and immoral um, in sports, uh, entertainment, business, finance, uh, politics, eventually they get caught, right? Money madness he talks about there. I'm going to skip over that. 
less than 30 years ago on that. So he's giving giving another uh, example in the little city of Shelby, right? So he's giving, uh, here is an example, right? So he's giving more examples. So I don't need to go over the examples. The examples expand upon and define and specify in the reader's mind what he's talking about in those relatively abstract or vague uh, statements of principle, right? Or like thesis or mini thesis. Uh, a good encyclopedia, is that how you spell that? I guess you think. A good encyclopedia contains most of the known facts of the world, but they are as useless as sand dunes until organized and expressed in terms of action. Yeah, it's just knowledge. It's just um, cold, dead facts, right? And if you think people are smart just because they know facts or trivial knowledge, nah. Intelligence comes from creating creative insight, right? Analyzing, inferring, deducing, right? Einstein or uh, Hawking or Feynman, Richard Feynman, you know, who was a great abstract physicist. Um, those people, right? Um, oh, here we go. There are three outstanding powers in the world of this organized effort. They are the churches, the schools, and the newspapers. I don't know if you believe that's true. He throws in a bit of religion. You may not be a religious person, so just ignore that. The concepts, these concepts work whether you're uh, religious or not, right? Oh, this course is in complete harmony with the principles of economics and the principles of applied psychology, see? So that's another reason why. Um, beautiful Mind, um, Dr. Nash, I forget his first name. Uh, there was a movie uh, movie made on this person's life. Uh, he was a uh, mathematician, a theorist. He uh, came up with um, game theory, outcomes, right? How to, 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 how to determine outcomes in games. You would think games, who cares? But what's interesting is that oftentimes great ideas translate to other disciplines. So he won the Nobel Prize. And uh, one day he was visited, he was quite old, by the Nobel Prize Committee. And he said, you know what? Um, we're here to offer you the Nobel Prize. Do you accept? No, go away. I don't want a million dollars in total absolute recognition and confirmation of my genius. Go away. But he said, yeah, sure. And uh, I think they applied it and they applied it in mathematics, other areas of mathematics other than um, game theory or random outcomes. Uh, also in economics and finance, several disciplines, right? We were able to apply your uh, concepts to other disciplines, right? So this is kind of what he's showing here. And I think that's another reason why I was I was studying uh, the various disciplines out there. And once you once you understand them, you really begin to see connections, right? And it helps you see a problem solve better, helps you see, to see the greater picture. You see better, more clearly, more thoroughly, more rigorously uh, than most, more comprehensively, right? You can become the guru, the go-to person. Most people are just kind of uh, zombies. And if you you work hard and you're rigorous and you're thinking and you're contemplating and you're research. And in, in your doing, in your um, massive action, another concept here, you'll be I hold a master's degree from Yale, so he's going, no two people on earth are exactly alike. I like that concept. And for this reason, no two people would be expected to attain from this course the same viewpoint. Exactly, right? Each student should read the course, understand it, and then appropriate from its contents whatever he or she needs, right? And that's what I'm saying. I'm not even saying that you need to take these courses. Just just pull. This is what I do all the time. I read tons, I read hundreds, thousands of books, and I'm constantly pulling. Ooh, ooh, that's a gem. That's a gold nugget, right? And I write it down, and I memorize it, and I contemplate it, and I write 100 articles on it so that I really know it thoroughly, rigorously, completely, comprehensively. Uh, this course has been compiled for the purpose of helping the student find out what his or her natural talents, innate, natural talents come to earth with natural talents, tendencies, gifts, desires, etc. And for the purpose of helping organize, coordinate, and put those uh, and put into use the knowledge gained from experience. Um, bottom paragraph there, one of the most startling facts brought to light by those 16,000 analysis 
analyses, I guess, was a discovery that the that 95% of those who were classed as failures were in that class because they had no definite chief aim. This is what I'm talking about. There it is, 95%, right? What did I say? There's highlight that little sucker. I don't have a highlight on this. All right. Uh, well, the 5% constitute the successful. This, this seems to be a common ratio. Uh, people who retire, uh, about 90, 95% are not ready. They don't have the money. Uh, about 5% are prepared, right? Uh, 90, 90, 95% are short, way short, oftentimes way short of what they needed for retirement. Not, not thinking, not preparing, not doing your homework, not, you know, I don't know, lazy, whatever. And a comma, not living a life. No position in life can be secure. No achievement can be permanent unless built upon truth and justice. There you go. There's your integrity. That's another thing I've taught my students. You know, um, philosophy, ethics. Read some book on books on ethics. I got some stuff. I can probably read it. The keynote of this entire lesson may be found in the word definite. It is most appealing to know that 95% of the people in the world are drifting without the slightest conception of the work for which they are best fitted and with no conception whatsoever. That's almost an absolute, right? Or it is, right? Of even the need of such a thing as definite objective towards which to strive. Definite chief aim that is deliberately fixed in the line and held there. So this is envisioning, right? Conceptualizing, kind of law of attraction. You focus on those things, not in the new agey pseudoscience sense, but you fix ideas in your mind or knowledge or data or habits or philosophies or concepts or ethical principles. Go over, 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 over. Do, 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 do. It's about immersion. Tony Robbins says, I don't have a short course. My course is a 72, 72 hours of complete, absolute immersion. The only way to learn, right? Your definite chief aim in life should be selected with deliberate care. Um, why did you choose to be an engineer? Uh, sounds good. Why did you choose to go into accounting? That's what my mom does. Why are you going into science, technology, engineering, math? Hot jobs, green jobs, hot jobs. The principle of psychology through which you can impress your definite chief aim upon your subconscious mind is called auto-suggestion. That's kind of what we're, we're talking about there, right? And again, definite purpose is constructive. Another one of the tragedies of this man's work is the fact that he is unconsciously making use of the principle of self-suggestion, but he is doing it to his own disadvantage, right? So he also talked about how not to do, and that's important. Sure, you want to know how to do, but also how not to do, right? I would give my students um, ideas. I would say, uh, here's how to get an F, right? Not how to get an A, but you know, here's you know, if you're interested, here's how to get an F. And then I would give them, they're like, an F? Why are you giving us that? All this stuff, right? And then they would go, oh, do the opposite. Gotcha. Right. How to fail. How to fail miserably. Greatly. How to fail greatly. How to be excited about your failure. Right. Mr. Lincoln, Mr. Washington, Mr. Emerson, Napoleon, right? So now he's exemplifying Hubbard, right? Um, the subconscious mind, third paragraph, may be likened to a magnet. This is it. This is what I was talking about. Attraction. Law of attraction. This is where um, the secret came from. I'll get it in a second. I'll see it. I'll look it up. Hold on. Talk among yourselves. It's been, oh, by Rhonda Byrne. There it is. Can you see that? Ron to burn the secret. Right. Um, so that comes from Law of Attraction from Napoleon Hill. Okay. Again, she repurposed his stuff. I don't even know if she credits him. Probably not, because I read that. I don't remember her crediting Napoleon Hill. Do not tell the world what you can do. Show it. That's kind of like when you're writing, right? 
don't, don't tell, show. She was in love. She loved him greatly. No, she moved to him closely and breathing in his breath. They, draw each, they drew each other in through their breathing, deep breathing of each other's breath, their lives, lives, their entities, their, their very beings were absorbed one to the other through their closeness, closeness, and inhaling of each other's essence. I gotta write that down. Um, what else we see? More examples. All great leaders base their leadership upon a definite chief aim. Even a bulky horse, bulky, nice word, knows when a driver with a definite chief aim takes hold of the reins and yields to that driver, right? Um, there's a comedian. Oh, a, a black comedian from like the, he's no longer with us. He was in the movie Superman. Um, not coming to mind his name, but uh, he, I think he wrote a book or somebody wrote a book and he was in it. And the, he talked about the fact that um, if you, if you put forth the persona that you're in control, right? Put forth the persona that you're in control. You went over the audience. As soon as you show a slight bit of intimidation, right? You can lose the audience. I know I did that stuff for five, six years, right? At first it's terrible. That took a long time, a lot of trial. You know, I used to go out four or five times, six days a week, working on my my act, you know, and just tell act, just getting comfortable up there, right? Um, let us now turn to the economic side of the question. That would have been plus that. Then. I am. Let's see if I'm going to skip ahead. Andrew Carnegie has my. Here's some advice from Andrew Carnegie. A specific uh, example that I think is worth going over. Place all your eggs in one basket and then watch the basket to see that no one kicks it over. <laughs> By that advice, he meant, of course, I like that when I, when I read something like that, you know, don't follow your passion. There was a video about that. Um, the guy that talks about dirty jobs, I forget his name. Don't follow your passion. As soon as I saw that, oh, because everybody's saying, follow your passion, follow your passion, follow your passion. There's another philosophy that if you see a lot of people doing something, don't do that. Do something else. What? Do something else. <laughs> right. Because after a while, people are not thinking. They're just doing, following, replicating, exactly replicating 95, 90, 95 percent. Just replicating what's been done before. So by that advice, he meant, of course, that we should not dissipate uh, any of our energies by engaging in sidelines. Carnegie was a sound economist. And he knew that most men would do well if they saw harness and directed their energies that some one thing would be done well. Short term. The best compensation for doing things is the ability to do more. That's good stuff. Anyways, let's see what else we got here. Um, he's got a lot of other examples. He's got Walworth in here. He's got Edison and Wrigley and Doherty and Barnes and Woodrow Wilson and Littleton and Eastman. He's using a lot of examples. The late Kaiser of Germany. Right. Anyone can start, but only the thoroughbred will finish. Finish the job, that's tough. That's one of the reasons why employers will hire people with a degree, right? Anyone can start, but only the thoroughbred. People who are really serious will get that degree. So you, sh you show a seriousness of intent. You're, you're really serious about your intents. You want a job? Well, you follow through on that degree. I'm guessing if you come work for us, you really want to work for us. You showed us through that degree, four years sticking to it. Your stick to itiveness precedes you. So therefore, we're most more likely to hire you than somebody just off the street or some unknown. Right. Uh, let's see, definite chief aim. Again, I don't want to go into way too much detail on this. I think that's about instructors. And this, so this is instructions for applying the principles of this lesson. And I like this, as I said, Thick Face Blackheart also does that. It's nice to show, uh, to, to convey the uh, definitions, the principles, and lay them out for the intellect, right? But then you wanna put them in action, not just sit there and have them in the mind, you know, and you wanna apply them to reality. So it's good to have that section, right? I think that's, that's about it. And there's the next section. All right, so we're done. Uh, next one is self-confidence. 
Um, until next time, we'll see you then.